welcome to this week's Healthcare Scene Hangout. We're here with a special guest, Mike Sendel. He's a 30-year industry veteran in healthcare IT, especially in security and compliance. He's an expert on HIPAA. He's someone I've known for a long time, and he's my go-to man when I want to talk about HIPAA and HIPAA security and privacy. So it seems appropriate that we have him on. In fact, we're, we're starting a whole, uh, I think we're going to do monthly uh, hangouts with Mike Sendel to talk about what's happening with HIPAA. But today... Uh, we're excited to talk about the HIPAA risk assessment. Mike, welcome. Glad to have you here. Thanks, John, for having me. Well, you know, uh, it's interesting. I'm sure people look at HIPAA risk assessments and say, wow, this is an exciting topic. But, uh, you know, I think it's an important topic. The HIPAA risk assessment has become essential to every healthcare organization, including business associates. So uh, hopefully today, you know, we can get some good stories about your experiences with it and uh, help uh, debunk some myths. So, you know, let's start out by talking about, you know, what percentage of the healthcare organizations do you think have done a proper HIPAA risk assessment? Well, John, I think the operative word there is proper. And my feeling is that it's pretty low, uh, maybe down into single digits. Uh, obviously, there are probably no statistics but when the uh, Office for Civil Rights did its uh, test audits a couple of years ago, they found that it was a big deficiency. And whenever there's a breach, there's likely to be found an insufficient or completely missing risk analysis. And uh, Devin McGraw, who is the uh, second person in charge of the Office, of, or Office for Civil Rights that handles HIPAA enforcement, said that uh, when they find breaches, it's very likely to also find that there hasn't been adequate uh, risk management, starting with a risk analysis. So, uh, you know, I'd say the majority, is, is that a fair term to say, uh, have, have issues with their risk assessment or haven't done a proper one? Well, I think so. And the reason for it is that many people try to do it themselves. There are uh, helping, there are tools that are supposed to help you do your own risk assessment. But my experience with a risk assessment is that when people really aren't doing well, they look pretty good in the mirror to themselves. <laughs> so when they do a, a self-assessment, what you've got is something that is uh, often wishful thinking. Often it's based on uh, bad information. And when we do a risk assessment, we ask a lot of questions and then we go kind of under the skin of the network. The risk assessment is specific to the security of electronic data. So it has to do with data that's stored on the uh, network and in devices and what we find more often than not almost always is a big disconnect between what people are telling us they're doing and what they're really doing interesting yeah i mean it's a disconnect i love the mirror analogy that you know we see ourselves differently than uh, what we think you know than what the reality is it's interesting i think it's fair to say that it's not enough to just buy a book and now you're HIPAA compliant as well so so let's dive in and talk about you know what would a proper risk assessment look like from your experience? Well, for all, it's not my opinion that there's a guide from NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, which provides basic guidance for government agencies and for the public on doing a risk assessment. And HIPAA is vague, and keep in mind, HIPAA was written by politicians. So <laughs> it, it's pretty vague in the sense that it says, you know, you should do a risk analysis, and there are many different ways to do a risk analysis, and you pick the one that best fits you. However, when the auditors come in, the auditors are coming in using the NIST standards to see if your risk assessment's complete. So you don't have to follow the NIST guidelines step by step, but if you do, go in yeah. step with the auditors, and if there's a data breach with the investigators that are looking at you. So you're not going to have to try to explain things. You're not going to have to try to get them uh, convinced that what you've written really does meet the standards. Our approach is, let's take that NIST guide, which by the way is 95 pages. So HIPAA has one line in it, essentially, that says you need to do a risk assessment, and people go, how do I do that? Well, there's a NIST guide that has 95 pages of guidance. The problem is that you still need to be able to understand the process, the language, and more than anything, you need to understand IT security to know what is going on under the network to make sure that you're looking at everything from how users are accessing data the devices that store those data files, and then all the communications networking in between, and that would even include uh, what I call sneaker net, which is someone putting information on a thumb drive and walking out the door with it. 
So you have to take into account all of those things. And a risk assessment in simplest terms says you have to identify where all of your data is. You have to identify all the routes that it takes within your organization and in and out of your organization. Then you have to look at the vulnerabilities that could be attacked to get to your data. You have to look at the threats that attack those vulnerabilities, try to determine the likelihood and then the impact. And between those two, the likelihood of an, of an event is not anywhere near as important as the impact of the event. So uh, if you're doing disaster planning, the fact that a hurricane may not happen very often doesn't mean you don't plan for it. In the IT risk assessment world, the fact that something may not happen very often, if the impact is high enough, you better plan for it. So you bring up two interesting points. One is, I think a lot of organizations, when they do their HIPAA risk assessment, don't have the expertise they need to really fairly evaluate it. Maybe it's not so much that they don't want to do a proper risk assessment, it's just that they don't have the skills and knowledge and expertise to actually do it effectively. Is that a fair statement? Well, I think it is. And, and there's one other thing that you didn't mention, they don't have the tools. So, you know, I go to a doctor when I'm not feeling well, not just to have him ask me some questions, but he has the ability to do a blood test and a urine test and an x-ray and an MRI and an ultrasound, whatever it is to diagnose what's going on underneath the skin, which may make me feel the way that I am. And that's where the data comes from. You know, everything I tell him is basically my opinion, you know, where it hurts, how much it hurts, how it feels. But once they do the tests, they come back with data and it's based on the data that is what gives the doctor the ability to do the diagnosis. It's the same thing with us when we do risk analysis. We ask questions, but we have tools that we can go in and use to either validate the information that was given to, to prove that it really is accurate or to have to tell someone, I know what you said to us, but here's the evidence that you're not doing that. And this needs to be fixed both for security reasons and for compliance. And you know, one of the problems we have is that people do things sometimes to be compliant and make themselves look good when underneath the security really isn't that strong. If they're gonna do something, they're better off really doing the security and focusing on it and then working on compliance just to make sure that the security is properly documented. Interesting. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it reminds me in almost anything that you do, I mean, even building a house or building anything, you know, the right tools make all the difference. <laughs> so, Right, but, you know, using that analogy, my brother-in-law is a contractor, and if you put tools in his toolkit, he's going to know how to use them, and he can build a house, and I'm going to know how to injure my swack and my thumb with a hammer. <laughs> so it's not just the tools. You have to have uh, the ability, and that's where, you know, I've got 30 years of experience in IT and in healthcare. We're able to see things that other people miss just because we know where to look. Well, it seems like also just fresh eyes, right? I mean, when you see something over and over, you kind of take it for granted. And having a, a fresh set of outside eyes you know, can make a huge difference uh, in, in seeing things that you just start taking for granted. Well, that's true. And the other thing about a fresh set of eyes is that if you're going to be audited, it's going to be by the government, a third party. If you're going to be investigated, if there's a breach or a complaint, you're going to be investigated by a third party. By having a thir another set of eyes on it, working for you, you get somebody that is independent of you. And, you know, sometimes it's like trying to proofread your own work. You, you read something over and over again, and then you hand it to someone else and they'll pick out an error that you just kept missing. But the other part of the third set of eyes or the second set of eyes is that it can validate that what you're doing is correct. It's not always, you know, a gotcha negative thing. And it gives you that comfort level that you're going to pass the audit or pass the uh, investigation, survive the investigation, because you've had a second set of eyes look at it. The government is, uh, through the Meaningful Use Program, has some conflicting guidance because uh, HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, has provided some tools to do a risk assessment. And under the guidance for meaningful use, it says, do I have to outsource my risk assessment? And their answer is no, you don't. But then they say, but if you want a risk assessment that will stand up to a compliance review, then you should consider hiring an outside professional. Well, they're the ones that do con 
compliance reviews. These are the people that do the compliance reviews, basically telling you if you want one that you know is going to stand up to a compliance review, hire an outside professional. <laughs> yeah, well, the government would never give out conflicting information. So. <laughs> no, no, no comment. They're probably listening in on us right now. That's true. They probably are. I, I can say that. You can. But, uh, you know, you brought up the other point, which I think is the other challenge I see with so many HIPAA risk assessments is that it's one thing to discover your issues. It's another one to actually remediate and mitigate those issues. Uh, you know, do you see that problem? What should they do? So they discover an issue or they, they work with someone like yourself to discover these issues. What's the process they need to do under HIPAA as part of the risk analysis to, you know, mitigate or remediate those issues? What's required and, you know, what, what do you suggest to them? Well, there are a couple of parts to that. First of all, we have people that come to us that say, I need a risk analysis, I need a risk analysis for meaningful use, or I need one for HIPAA. And we tell them, you know, we'd be glad to help them with that, but they also have to consider that once they get that risk analysis, they're obligated to address their risks. Now, there's some uh, flexibility in how you do that, depending on the size of your practice or the size of your organization and some other uh, considerations. But the first item in the security rule is you have to conduct a risk analysis. The second item in the security rule is you have to mitigate the risks. You have to have a risk management process in place. And HIPAA, there's other guidance from HHS, from OCR, and even from Meaningful Use that said HIPAA is a continuous process of identifying risks and addressing them. What gets missed in the Meaningful Use guidance is that when you look at the core measures for the security risk analysis, it says you have to conduct the risk analysis. It also says you have to mitigate your risks before or during the reporting period. So where people have gotten caught up is that they've waited till the very end of the reporting period and, and say it's December 31st, they'll call us on December 26th and ask if we can do a risk analysis for them between you know December 26th and the 31st. And in some cases we've been able to do it, in other cases we've had to say no. But my question back to them is, if we get it done by the 31st, how are you gonna mitigate your risks during the reporting period? And we've had people tell us, oh, I have until February to do that. And the answer is no, the reporting period ends December 31st. However, you don't ha you, you do have until say February 28th or whatever the date is to do your attestation for that reporting period. But we have to educate people a lot to read past that one line. Sometimes it's the first time they're seeing it is when we're showing it to them. But they know they need a risk analysis. What they don't know is that they also have to mitigate those risks. Now, when I said it's reasonable, there's some reasonableness to this. Within HIPAA, there are required standards. There are, are, are implementation standards. There are also, um, or implementation specifications, there are also addressable ones. So with addressable ones, you have a little bit of flexibility in terms of actually doing what they say you have to do or coming up with an alternative way to do it. But when we find risks like Windows XP systems and server 2003s and computers that don't have never had patches and updates or antivirus software installed or a real firewall on a network, that has to be remediated. That isn't something that you can just decide we're not going to do because there have been HIPAA penalties and people have given back meaningful use money when they haven't remediated their risks. Interesting. So let's talk more about that. I know you have so many stories about experiences with uh, poor risk assessments. I mean, I think that's a great example, right? Someone does a risk assessment, doesn't identify that they have a bunch of Windows XP machines, which they haven't dealt with, right? I think that's a great example. Are there other examples you've seen where you get into a, an organization and uh, you know they haven't done a proper risk assessment? Well, we've seen a lot of places that haven't done a proper risk assessment, and in many times, in many cases, that's why they're coming to us. So, uh, what we've seen, we've seen everything from a checklist that someone handed them, where they literally went check, 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 and said our risk analysis is done. Uh, I saw on a website recently that a doctor or a dental practice should log in, do the 15-minute finish, uh, fill out a 15-minute questionnaire, and your risk assessment's done. And 
I mean, I don't know how anybody could even uh, think that that was a risk assessment, because if you go back to the basics, where's all of your data? Have you identified all the locations of the data? Have you identified all the routes that the data takes in and out of the organization? What are all the vulnerabilities? What are all the threats? There's no one that can fill that out in 15 minutes. There's no one that can fill it out with a form and then not know and not be able to validate what they're doing. Uh, in the HIPAA enforcement uh, list, you're going to find some different situations that relate to the risk assessment. Most of them say that the risk assessment was never done. But there was one, I think it was Concentra Healthcare, that had a uh, laptop that was stolen and they had done a security risk analysis. They had identified in their security risk analysis that they had laptops that had data on them and they're a home health care organization so they needed to have people carry health care into the field they had roughly 600 laptops if i remember right and for financial reasons they decided they were going to spread out the installation of the encryption software over four calendar quarters or financial quarters so that they didn't take the financial hit all in one quarter well you can probably guess the rest. Three quarters of the year had gone by. They had 150 laptops left to do out of the 600. One of those got stolen and they paid a $1.7 million fine. And basically the Office for Civil Rights said, you knew you had a problem. You knew you had to mitigate the problem. You didn't mitigate it. And that's why you're paying us $1.7 million. And the message there, I think the lesson learned is when you identify something now, I don't know what the exact time frame is. Obviously, if you identified a risk that 600 laptops needed to be encrypted, you couldn't do it tomorrow or within a, you know, a week or two weeks. But by spreading it out over four calendar quarters for financial reasons was not acceptable. So my guess is that if they had done a two month project or a three month project, something like that to get all those laptops encrypted, they would not have gotten a $1.7 million fine. I don't know exactly where the tipping point was, but by dragging it out as long as they did, they got a big penalty. Yeah, well, I've always described HIPAA as very reasonable. I mean, if you put a reasonable time frame to get them encrypted, they probably would have been fine. But, you know, a year long rollout uh, is not very reasonable, right? So. Well, right. And I also think that, you know, size matters. So when you have an organization the size of Concentra, they have the financial resources to do something a lot faster than probably, you know, a small office that, you know, doesn't have a full time IT staff and doesn't have the financial wherewithal maybe to fix things. So Ann Zeiger's in uh, joining us live, and she asked the question, uh, you know, how do you predict which employees will voluntarily violate HIPAA? And she kind of extends it and says, can appropriate policies remediate this risk? Or are employee background checks in excess of the standard checks necessary? Uh, I think, you know, that is a huge issue, right? Employees are the biggest HIPAA risk. So how do you kind of mitigate that under HIPAA? Are there things you can do, things you should do, policies you should have in place? Well, yeah. For, first of all, you have to have policies in place because you have to have something not only for guidance, but if you're going to discipline someone, you have to have a specific policy you know, that, that you're showing them. But having policies doesn't mean anything if the people aren't trained. Yeah. So when it comes to you know, what do you do with employees? Uh, background checks are not required. We certainly recommend them. Uh, there's been some legislation recently in some of the states that our clients have sent us where the state legislatures are not allowing people to do financial credit checks anymore. Now, I don't think that this is, uh, I don't know where it stands in terms of how many states have those laws, but I know that several of them are. And, you know, that's going to uh, hamper some of these uh, healthcare organizations in terms of determining whether they think a person is a risk or not, because if you can't do a financial background check, they may not have a criminal background, but they may have financial difficulties that you would want to know about because medical records are worth a lot of money on the black market. And if you're going to give them access to those medical records, uh, even though they don't have a criminal background uh, history, that you may want to know their financial. But policies and procedures more than anything, training and uh, enforcement. And I, when I say enforcement, I'm not talking about enforcement at the government level. I'm talking about enforcement in the workplace. 
So one of our clients called us last week and said that a nurse had been snooping in a patient record and that they had suspended the nurse. They had some questions about how to handle the incident. And it was appropriate that they do that. There were some mitigating circumstances where they weren't sure they needed to suspend her. But what it really got down to was an HR decision that they had suspended other people for for snooping in records. And if they did not suspend this nurse for doing it, and it was pretty black and white, and the nurse admitted that she had done it, and there were logs that showed she did it, that they were going to have a discrimination problem the next time they tried to enforce it. So if they didn't do anything with this nurse, and then they fired the next person for doing it, that person's lawyer is going to you know, gather the information and say, you discriminated against my client because of selective enforcement. So policies, procedures, training, certainly. Uh, awareness is also important because a lot of uh, healthcare organizations will do their annual HIPAA training and their OSHA training and other things in December or January and then schedule it for the next year. Well, in September, nine months later, is someone really going to remember what that phishing email looks like that you showed them that they shouldn't open or what the policy is about something or a reminder that they shouldn't be looking in people's records and they see their neighbor walk down the hall and they're wondering, you know, why their neighbor's coming in for treatment. If you've just reminded them that they can be uh, disciplined, terminated, or you'll even assist in their prosecution, that uh, a reminder is important too. So policies, procedures, training, awareness, reminders, and then enforcement. Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you've brought up some interesting points about why it's so important that they do a proper risk assessment. You talked about the fines. It was at 1.6 million, you said, or something like that. Millions of dollars of fines if you don't do a proper risk assessment. But then you brought up the other one, the risk of, uh, you know, those employees and lawyers coming after you because you didn't do, you know, proper enforcement as well. Uh, and, you know, then there's, of course, the PR hit of not doing it. Uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen plenty of that as well. Yeah, the, the PR hit is, is what finally gets the attention of executives. And, and that's the one thing that, you know, when we talk to clients or we're being approached by clients, we're being approached sometimes by a compliance officer or someone, uh, you know, director level, not, not low in the, you know, not at the uh, lowest level of the uh, org chart, but not the executives. And then, you know, once an incident happens, all of a sudden the executives are the ones that want to talk about it and are concerned because, you know, the information's coming to them. As I've said to some executives, when you have a big breach and that satellite TV truck shows up in your hospital's parking lot, they aren't there to talk to the IT guy. They want to talk to the CEO and the executives are on the line. And when you look at the Sony breach and the Target breach and even the recent uh, scandal with Volkswagen and the diesel emissions, uh, the CEOs are all gone. So these breaches can certainly affect people and their positions uh, at the highest levels. It's amazing how that budget suddenly became available that wasn't available before once you have a yeah. breach. <laughs> exactly. And, and also, uh, it, it, when you're taking somebody that is, say, a doctor that has invested a lot in their education, uh, we even deal with business associates who are lawyers and they're doing medical malpractice cases and, and they're defending healthcare organizations. So they're a HIPAA business associate. We're not talking about them, t talking to them necessarily about a HIPAA violation or a penalty or something like that. But under the ethics rules for attorneys that the state bar associations enforce, that same breach that in a healthcare organization would just be a reportable breach for uh, compliance purposes, that in, in a law firm, that would be a violation of the ethical requirements for confidentiality. And in some cases, there are other ethical rules for competence and they could lose their law license if there's a breach. Yeah. Interesting. So let's take a little step back from what we've been talking about and talk a little bit bigger picture. Uh, do you think the HIPAA risk assessments in their current form have, have helped or hurt healthcare? Has it been good or bad? I mean, meaningful use essentially piled on the HIPAA risk assessment and said that's the cornerstone of what we should do with HIPAA compliance, I think. Has that been good or bad or what do you think? 
Well, uh, first of all, I think it's been good, but it's, it's long before HIPAA that we were doing risk assessments. HIPAA came out in 2003 with a privacy rule and the risk assessment didn't show up until 2005 in the security rule. And we had been doing risk assessments for 20 years before that uh, in IT and also in business continuity and disaster recovery planning. So I don't think, I, I can't imagine how anybody could think that it would hurt because the risk assessment is specifically designed to identify what risks you have so that you can deal with them. It's kind of like asking, you know, are physicals good for patients? And if you go to the doctor and he doesn't do a physical and know all the baseline things that are that, that are your conditions, I'm not even saying they're wrong with you, but what's your cholesterol number? What's your blood pressure and all these things? How can that doctor effectively treat you without having some basic information? The basic information under HIPAA and the security rule and protecting electronic data is the risk analysis. Again, where's your data? How do you protect data if you don't know where it is? Then how does it move around? How can you control, how can you fix your risks or address your risks if you don't know that people are carrying laptops with data or putting data on thumb drives or sending it up into the cloud into some service that maybe you don't know about and they signed up for a free account? So. I mean, maybe I'm a bigot, but I don't think there's anything wrong with a risk analysis, and I don't know how you could protect anything. And I'm not just talking about health data. I don't know how you could protect the business from business losses or if you could protect uh, even your money in the bank without somebody having do, done a risk analysis to find out what might happen. Yeah, I mean, I think the argument people make is that one is set the bar too low, uh, that they should have more, uh, you know, a higher bar that organizations should try to get to, and that, they, you know, with no enforcement of it, you know, just kind of saying do one, it's on your own, it's almost like self-attestation and need for use, you know, it's like you're just doing it on your own and saying, yeah, I did a risk assessment, you know, that that, that hasn't been enough and that, you know, hasn't been effective and that, you know, if we didn't have that framework, people might actually do more than what they're doing today. I, I think that's the argument people make, uh, you know, that maybe that it's not enough. Well, I, I think there's a difference between whether it's effective or whether it's good. I mean, good good meaning, is it a good thing to do? Yes. Is it good in terms of are they have they been affected? I don't think so, based on what I've seen. And, you know, I, I just have a problem with the government being so vague and saying, you know, you can do it on your own, you can do it any way you want to, and not issuing more specific guidance. And I'm talking specifically about HHS and, and with, this, with HIPAA compliance. Uh, you know, going through a 95-page manual written uh, by NIST, which is essentially writing in a language for uh, government agencies, probably isn't the best way to do it for a small practice. So HHS will tell you and they'll pride themselves on telling you they have all these great tools and there's a risk assessment tool out on a website and everything. The problem is we have sat down with people and had them answer all those questions and then we've run our own tests on their network and looked at what their procedures were and processes and they weren't anywhere near what they said they were. So my problem with the effectiveness of these tools is that people answer questions not knowing what the real answers are. Sometimes they believe things because, you know, they'll ask a question and be told an answer, but they don't have any evidence to base it on. So, you know, again, our approach is ask the questions, but then generate hard evidence. And that's what we really use to uh, create the, the risk management plan. And it goes right back to standard healthcare. You go to the doctor, you tell him where it hurts, he runs a blood test, a MRI, an x-ray, whatever, and comes back and says, okay, well, here's where the source of your pain is, and we're going to prescribe this medication, or we're going to have you come in and, and go through this treatment, or we're going to do an operation, and we're going to fix that. But that's the only way they know what's really going on. Yeah. Excellent. Well, you've offered some really great insights into the HIPAA risk assessment uh, Tell everyone that's watching at home and uh, that listens to the podcast later, where can they find you? What's your website? Are you on Twitter? What's the best way they can get a hold of you and, and learn more about your services? Okay. Well, the best way to learn about us really is at our website. Uh, we have information about the organization. We have a uh, blog page that has a lot of articles on it that people have told us have helped them. We have some uh, a download area where there's some HIPAA information and actually business continuity planning is another service we offer. So there's information on business continuity planning out there. And it's simple, www.semelconsulting.com. 
S-E-M-E-L consulting.com. There's also a way to contact us there. Excellent. And I know you also write a regular blog there, which I think many will find interesting, lots of interesting insights and updates on what's happening with it as well. Yeah, I've had a recent article uh, that I wrote called Imagine Failing a HIPAA Audit, talking about the new audit program, and that's gotten a lot of play, and I've heard from a lot of people that have read that. Excellent. I, I, you know, like I said, we're hoping to have you back uh, here about every month or so, so maybe our next one will have to be, what happens when you fail a HIPAA audit? What do you do? That might be a good topic for next week. Well, I, I suggest changing the title, John, is how do we prevent you from failing a HIPAA audit? And here's what you should do. That's a good idea, too. All right. Well, thanks so much for being here, and uh, thanks for joining us. And once again, check out Mike Semmel at SemmelConsulting.com, uh, and we'll have you back again. Uh, this is, my name is John Lynn. I'm the founder of HealthcareScene.com, where we cover uh, healthcare IT topics, HIPAA, and anything related to healthcare and technology. Thanks for coming.